Buddy, Buddy Ryan, Ryan was Philadelphia's winningest coach who never won. By A.J. Dolirio. Read to you by Brian Jaffrey. Buddy Ryan's introductory press conference as new coach of the Philadelphia Eagles in 1986 began with this ridiculous statement. You got a winner in town. Two weeks before the press conference, Ryan was carried off the field by the Bears after their Super Bowl XX victory, lionized as the architect of the 46 defense, and now here he was in town to duplicate his success and there was no reason not to believe him if only because he said so. As coach of the Eagles he won one NFC East title. Yet if you polygals sycophants who throw half full beer cups at the children of Cowboys fans, Buddy Ryan won Super Bowls in each of his five seasons, even though his actual playoff record was 0-3. In fact, one of the top 10 Philadelphia sports moments was when Buddy he tried to sock offensive coordinator Kevin Gilbride in the jaw, even though this happened while he was a defensive coordinator of the Houston Oilers. He missed on that punch, too, by the way. This is actually what Buddy Ryan brought to Philadelphia. Whip Sports Talk Radio Idiocy, the Wing Bowl, the 700-level Anarchy in Vet Stadium. He brought out the self-mythologized, entitled, Calvin Pissing on Aikman's Jersey Side of Philadelphia Sports Fandom. If you can't win anything, create a spectacle. Spectacles sometimes have more impact than actual wins and irregular actual losses from the historical record. Who needs rings when you can cripple a kicker? That's what's so amazing about Buddy Ryan's Eagles legacy. Dick Vermeil's teary-eyed press conference is almost brought a real-life Super Bowl winning team in 1980-81. He and Andy Reid, who won important playoff games for the Eagles more often than not, would both still probably lose out to having a stadium named after them in favor of Buddy. Winning percentages didn't mean half as much as the perception that Ryan's insane defense over offense bluster was somehow more important than whatever the scoreboard said at game's end. Now that there's actual math to show the true value of wins and losses for most professional sports leagues, Buddy's never gonna be revealed as any sort of genius for what he did as a coach. And imagine the outrage takes that would result from Buddy's petty battles with Tom Landry that carried over to Jimmy Johnson's cowboy teams. He'd be run out of town real quick in the modern NFL. But what if there is some mystical side to winning that undermines all those empirical formulas? Because Buddy Ryan was the living embodiment of the Rocky statue of Philadelphia sports, touch it and its existence is real, even though what it represents is pure fiction. And that's why Buddy Ryan always won, because it felt like he did. And once took a swing at Gilbride on the sideline. His relationship with former Bears coach Mike Ditka was equally volatile. Ryan and Ditka had to be separated by players in Miami at halftime of the Bears' only loss of the 1985 season. When Ditka was hired to coach the Bears by George Hollis in 1982, it was under the condition that he retained Ryan as defensive coordinator. Ryan had been in Chicago the previous three years, and as the 1981 season wound down, Page and Fancy wrote a letter to Hall Eyes asking that Ryan not be fired. Writing the letter was about what was in the best interests of the team, said Page, who was retiring. When you have a good thing, why throw out the baby with the bath? Shortly after Ditka was hired, Ditka told Ryan he wanted to run the flex defense, which Ditka was familiar with from his time with the Cowboys. Fancy said Ryan told Ditka, You are the head guy. You can do whatever you want. But I won't be here. I'm not going to run that defense. Ditka backed off. Ryan subsequently showed little deference to Ditka, ignoring his suggestions, telling his defensive players Ditka didn't know defense, and referring to him as that guy. When Ryan left the Bears after Super Bowl XX to become head coach of the Eagles, Ditka said, I'm not happy he's gone, I'm elated. And he said, Never again in history will an assistant coach get as much credit as Buddy did. The two carried on a feud for years, but when Ditka suffered a heart attack in 1988, Ryan called Ditka's assistant to see how he was. It wasn't until 2010, at a 25th anniversary celebration of the Super Bowl, that Ditka and Ryan buried the hatchet.
Ditka subsequently has spoken glowingly of Ryan. Ditka attended a 2011 dinner at which Ryan was honored and called Ryan the best assistant coach ever. Ditka wasn't the only superior Ryan shirked off. When he was coaching the Eagles, he referred to team owner Norman Brayman as that guy in France. He would say Eagles general manager Harry Gamble was Brayman's illegitimate son. Ryan could be difficult for players to get along with as well. He often referred to them only by their jersey numbers or unflattering nicknames. My impression was that he couldn't remember people's names, Page said. His players came to loathe his post-game tape reviews. In front of the entire defense, Ryan would go over a play, mentioning first who made the tackle and who made an assist. Any other player who did his job on the plan escaped notice. But many did not. You were either horse, expletive, dumb, expletive, or, expletive, hole, Fisher said. Horse, expletive, meant you missed a tackle or dropped an interception. Dumb, expletive, would be you made a mental mistake. And you didn't want to be an, expletive, pole. What could be expected from a coach who had been a master sergeant in the army during the Korean War at 18? His son Jim told Sports Illustrated in 1994 that Ryan still slept with his hand near his collarbone, where he used to keep his gun in Korea. It was a habit formed because the Chinese used to strangle soldiers with wire while they were sleeping. You lead men going into combat with you, and they trust you on ambush patrol, Ryan said years later. That prepared me for what was coming. As hard a man as Ryan could be, he had another side to him. Gruff exterior, warm human being underneath, Page said. His first wife, Doris, said Ryan taught Sunday school and sometimes would be brought to tears by him in church. Ryan also teared up on the eve of Super Bowl XX. Knowing he was soon to leave Chicago, he told his defensive players, I just want you guys to know that no matter what happens out there, you will always be my heroes. As many of his players wept, Steve McMichael stood up, picked up his chair and threw it across the room, impaling a blackboard with its legs. The late Hall of Fame defensive end Reggie White once said players either loved Ryan or hated him, but most players White knew loved him. The late Jerome Brown, who played under Ryan in Philadelphia, once said, I'd sell my body for body. Hall of Famer Hampton said, so many of us would have run through a wall for the guy. We all loved him, just loved him. Player agent Jim Solano, who also served as an advisor to Ryan, said three of his former Eagles clients, Clyde Simmons, Seth Joyner and Terry Hoge, wanted to follow Ryan so badly when he became head coach of the Cardinals that they accepted millions less than what they could have received elsewhere in order to play for him. Ryan was known for his ability to teach as well as motivate. What I learned about this game from then to now, he was the reason, former Bears linebacker Otis Wilson said. Ryan was not concerned that his players go by the book. He would tolerate players being late to meetings or lying on the floor while he spoke. Page never liked to study opponents. He decided to run long-distance races and had lost 20 pounds when the Bears acquired him. Page said the only thing Ryan cared about was that Page was making plays. Ryan had survived two boats with melanoma as well as a case of encephalitis. He spent his later years on horse farms in Kentucky. Born February 17, 1931, Ryan earned four letters as a guard at Oklahoma A&M. His childhood was spent in a house with no electricity or indoor plumbing. At Oklahoma A&M, now Oklahoma State, he studied the style of legendary basketball coach Hank Ebaugh and learned how to motivate. Learning how to tear down a player with one sentence, Ryan once said. That's what coaching's all about. Chicago Tribune's Brad Biggs contributed to this report.